In today's episode, we are going to visit the historical neighborhood of Poindexter Village. In this week's segment, Our Neighborhood, and explore the history of Poindexter Village and founder James Preston Poindexter in an exhibit at COSI with the founder of the Poindexter Legacy Project, Rada Smith. Poindexter Village was named for the Reverend James Preston Poindexter, 1819 to 1907, an abolitionist, civil rights advocate, social justice pioneer, politician, and Baptist minister. Operated by the Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority, Poindexter Village opened in 1940 as one of the first public housing projects in America. President Roosevelt visited Poindexter Village on Columbus Day, October 12, 1940, to celebrate this achievement in affordable housing. In the past decades, as demolition of much of the village proceeded in 2013, Many people have committed to save the village like Rada Smith, president of the James Preston Poindexter Foundation. Hello, my name is Deidre Hamler and I am a native resident of Columbus, Ohio. I grew up on the Near East Side and I was asked to coordinate the Poindexter Legacy Project. Um, part of the project involved putting together a feasibility study to preserve the remaining two Poindexter Village buildings which are at the site that was raised about three years ago. Um, since creating that feasibility study, as a part of the feasibility study we also had um, we had a request from the city and from the Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority to design an exhibit that would be reminiscent of the community of Poindexter Village that would honor the residents of Poindexter Village and speak to the migration of African Americans to the Central Ohio area so we created this exhibit with a committee that was developed from community representatives and um, a committee of a about 12 people was was uh, worked together for over a year and a half to develop what you see here at this exhibit. The committee partners as well as community representatives from um, everywhere from the Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority, the Poindexter uh, Foundation, Poindexter, James Preston Poindexter Foundation, from the Coalition for Sustainable Development of the Near East Side, um, the Ohio State University, City, as well as PACT that was our PACT was our actually the organization that that brought us together initially are, is responsible for the exhibit today. Um, my role was to coordinate all of those different individuals and those organizations so that we could create um, a visual display of artifacts, art, historical um, reminiscence, and also community input that would give people a feeling of what it was like when Poindexter Village was built, what led African American to this community, what sustained them during that time, and what has happened over the transition of many, many years that impacted the community of Poindexter Village, as well as the whole Near East Side area. So that's what the exhibit speaks to. We speak to the migration, we speak to the development, we speak to the construction, we speak to the hope that was in the community when it was built in 1940 with the funding from the federal government. And now we look at what happened after the community was transitioning through a lot of economic and social um, upheaval in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And where are we now in the 2000s? Where are we now in terms of what is going to be de developed in the area? And so the future is really in the hands of the community, all of us. Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority has decided um, and has already built new 
new buildings, new facilities for seniors, for new residents, mixed income housing. Um, the community is going to be rich with new businesses, with economic opportunities, with opportunities for individuals to have businesses in their own homes, with new streets, with new street lights, with um, an avenue that will connect the Near East Side and Point Dexter Village area to downtown with caps over the freeway. And um, we're looking really look, look forward to being able to celebrate the future, but more importantly, want to celebrate the future as well as remember the past because we could not be standing here today if we did not understand the past upon which we were built. So that's why we're here today. Good morning, I'm Rita Smith, and I, at this time, I am the chairperson of the James Point, Preston Poindexter Foundation, and it is my pleasure, and I'm so pleased the committee has worked so hard to create this exhibit which tells the story in part about Point Dexter Village. Point Dexter Village was a very unique place. And the one item that we can't bring to these one to this wonderful exhibit is the importance of what families felt and appreciated about being a part of Point Dexter. That feeling of community, that feeling of safety, that feeling of value was all a part of Point Dexter Village. It was so much much more than brick and mortar. Um, I lived there in the 50s with my children and I could place my young babies out in the yard and my neighbors looked after them. They were always safe and secure. The, the play area was the the way it was built, it was really built like a village because you had a courtyard in between the buildings and that was the playground for the young people of, of the community. Uh, your neighbor was your family. Uh, the values, the dignity, there was high standards. If you misbehaved, you were asked to leave. And that was the kind of community that all communities want, even today, but it's missing in our story. But the stories that we get, every person that we interview tells about that safety, that, that sense of community. So, but even though this is wonderful, if we could just add the feelings, it would be perfect. It would be like smell-o-vision if you could bring that to this exhibit. But the exhibit tells you what the community was like and if we really understood how Columbus developed as an Afro-American community, if you followed our communities across the city, it would always give you that sense of community. But as this exhibit describes how that process occurred. We did come here from the, through the Great Migration and found safety, even when it was the Blackberry Patch. It might have been run down houses but it was so much safer than being from what they had left in the deep south so the black Perry patch they talk about the smells of the fish fry on Friday don't we wish we had that smell of vision right now but from the blackberry patch to the construction of Poindexter Village they the Blackberry Patch wasn't the whole area. We lost some other good housing even then, but it came through Franklin Delava, uh, Franklin Dela D. Roosevelt when he came for the dedication. The day nursery, which had been created to, to give relief for parents that had to, to do their domestic work. That was where their children went, which was right along on Ohio Avenue, right up the street from Poindexter. But all those children lined the streets when President Roosevelt came through. Came through. Now my sisters, who are 88 and 89, can remember even today, they said they could almost touch the president when he came through for that dedication that day. But we have to remember, Poindexter was built not as public housing, 
but affordable housing. It was built after the Great Depression, and there was a problem with housing and economics all across this country. So Poindexter was a part of that solution for Afro-American communities. Remember, it was during segregated times, so it was built primarily for black people. And when we when they built it, they built it with love and with it values and expectations for working families to have affordable housing. And then and it was that transition period that it allowed them to save money and then go and purchase their own homes. So it was a transitional situation for so many families. Listen, you're my friend. I noticed you haven't really been yourself recently. Yeah, I feel like something's up. How are you? Are you okay? Is there anything you want to talk about? I just want to know how you're feeling. And listen, even if you don't know what to say, I'm here to talk. No matter what you're going through, I just want you to know I'm here. I've got your back. When you want to talk, I'm here. Listen to me. I am captain of the track team. And if I'm late, she doesn't I'm really think she's going to get out of here, does she? Be nice. She's new. Hello, is anyone there? <gasps> wow. Even from our standards, you look awful. Oh, sweetie, what happened? Me? My friend Becky got to talk to this super cute boy, and I tried to act like I wasn't jealous, but I so totally was. And then out of nowhere, this concrete barrier just popped up. Maybe it was a semi. You mean you were driving? Yeah. I mean, I know the whole eyes on the road thing, but this was a super important text. Maybe you have to know, Becky. Uh, texting? Great. But I, it was only like five seconds, and I'm a really, really fast texter, so it wasn't even a big deal. Actually, has she texted me back yet? Wow, I get like no... Hi, I'm Gwen Harshaw. I am Zane Harshaw's mother, and my son learning the guitar has transformed our lives. I'm, my son was diagnosed at four with autism, and that led to a lot of changes. We got very involved with the local disability community, and we've, we've, so my husband and I have served on several boards. We're involved with a lot of different organizations, and we are particularly involved with our son who taught himself to play the guitar and now is a professional music musician, plays all around Ohio and even in other states. Um, all pretty, uh, very, very organic. Um, when he said he wanted to play the guitar, we got him a guitar, didn't think much of it, and then we discovered he really had a gift and we started playing around, actually in the beginning, just for fun at, at open mics and that sort of thing, and then people started hiring him. And um, it's, it's been amazing. Now he also plays with his band, Blue Spectrum. It's a five piece band. So we, um, and we, we, just, we just added a saxophone player who was amazing. Um, two of the members are on the autism spectrum, Zane, the, my, my son, the guitarist, and Amelia, who is our keyboardist. And we have three other members. We have a fabulous vocalist, bass player, and um, of course, drummer, percussion. And we play all over, we play at some of the big festivals around town. In fact, this weekend, we're gonna be playing at the Creekside Blues and Jazz Festival. We're gonna be playing at Grove City's Arts and Wine Festival. And then the following week, we're gonna play at ComFest, which we're really, really excited. In fact, that's our third year at ComFest. Um, 
My son just got back from Orlando where we played for an organization, um, a fundraiser called Music Mu Movement. They're based in California, but we played, my son played at the BB King Blues Club in Orlando, and that was amazing. And, um, but along with that, we, we speak a lot. We talk to people, we, um, we speak at conferences, and our message is just, you know, don't, don't let a diagnosis prevent you from getting your child or your loved one involved. We were told Zane would never read. He had severe dexterity issues. He had to take eight years, almost eight years of occupational therapy. We had no idea that he'd be able to play the guitar like that. I mean, he, he's, he's renowned for playing very fast and very well, having great dexterity skills. And we've had many veteran guitarists say, wow, how does he do that? So you just, you don't know, don't give up. In the beginning, when he, I mean, he, he, he played the trumpet in school, and that's when we noticed he seemed to have an ear, and we, we found out shortly after that that he had perfect pitch, which means he can um, hear something and basically play it back perfectly. He knows the key with no reference point, which is actually a pretty rare gift, although we're finding out um, that it's not as rare among people on the spectrum, which is very, very interesting. And... Um, in the beginning, we just wanted him to be able to do something that he loved, that he got a lot of enjoyment, something no one could take away from him. But as it grew, it, it, it's, it's, it, it wants to be, he wants music to be his job. And that's what we're working for. And it seems like we're going in that direction. But it, it is, it's changed our lives. It's changed Zane. Zane used to be very painfully shy, kind of in his own world. And music is kind of like that communication bridge. And that's something that can... A, a lot of individuals with autism have trouble with communication, they have trouble with connecting. Music is definitely Zane's connection. And he's a different person when it involves the guitar and music. Um, basically, um, w well, I'll say we, we use the phrase live out loud, and that has worked very well. Even before the guitar abilities em emerge, just, you know, I mean, accepting your loved one, accepting your child for who they are, and just following them. A lot of times parents have a really set image in their mind of what they want their child to be. Ne neither myself or my husband are musicians. In fact, I took piano lessons as a kid and I wasn't very good. So <laughs> I don't know where he got the skill, but it wasn't me. But, um, but um, if, I mean, there were things they struggled with, but music came so easily to him and it was so natural. So we, we needed to change our perspective and not focus on the things that he struggles with, but focus on his strengths. And I think every parent, regardless of the disability or not, should do that. I, um, I was born in, in, in Texas, but my parents were in the Air Force and they moved here and when I was three and I've been in Columbus, Ohio since I was three years old. At the thing I mentioned um, about really kind of letting your child lead. I mean, it's a different generation than with my parents that um, just allowing their strengths to flourish and not be so harsh or stringent or inflexible where you're pushing. Because I mean, I remember I was devastated when he got the diagnosis and when they said he'd never read, that killed me. But it was really, and of course it was wonderful schools and teachers and therapies, but music, I think, really opened him up to reading because he loves to read about music. And just, um, but if we had just focused on the diagnosis, on um, what people told us were his deficits, and had been so legalistic about academics, because I, I mean, in the beginning, I was. I mean, I, I mean, that's not a bad thing, but we, I really focused on reading and math and those things. And, and some of that, he had some definite gifts. And some of the things he struggled, but if I had been so stuck on that and hadn't seen beyond it, I, I think we might be in a very different place right now. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. The black truck. Hey.
Christina from accounting. Yeah, hi. <laughs> hey, I used to date a girl named Christina. Oh, really? Yeah, and then she dumped me for my best friend. You want to see some photos of them that I took? I don't. I thought we talked about this, buddy. Buzz and overshared again? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to call a car. That's a smart idea. So, yeah, I know. That's why I did it. Hey, you're going to get back to the top of the mountain. Does that mean I'm going to get back with Christina? No. Oh. No, no. Juan well, Taylor, um, Fishing with a Mission, I am the founder. Mike Daly, uh, one of the Fishing organization. So Fishing Fish with a Mission started um, three years ago. Um, and the reason it got started, I used to, I, I've been fishing for many years. My mother got me started as a young man in Malibu, West Virginia. And um, I just always loved fishing. Well, um, I really got serious about 15 years ago and every single year, I would have a fish fry and I would bite, invite 50 to 60 of my friends. Well, it became a job because, you know, when you're out there fishing, it's not always going to be, they're going to bite a lot, you know, so I've always wanted to make sure I had a lot, enough fish to feed 50 or 60 people. And so three years ago, my wife and I were vacationing in uh, Gatlinburg. And that, at that moment, I said, I'm not doing the, uh, the fish fry anymore. I want to, start doing something that's not really a job, something that I enjoy. And so um, we was walking along the strip and I went to this little t-shirt shop and that's where I had my first t-shirt airbrushed, um, fishing with a mission, so yeah. Um, well, I've been fishing with Juan for a number of years. Um, he thought about the idea, <coughs> excuse me, and I thought it was a great idea. I mean, we, for years we've been, um, like I said, giving fish to a lot of people. We fish almost three, four times a, a week. And um, it got to the point where we would literally call people up and say, hey, we got fish, do you want it? And when he uh, thought about the idea of actually giving the uh, fish and feeding the homeless, um, I thought it was a great idea um, you know, to give back to the community and uh, give to uh, those that were less fortunate. So actually, the, um, the fish mission started in 2016. And uh, 2018, I, my wife worked really, very really hard and diligently to get my 501. So. I am a 501 um, nonprofit organization. Everybody. Um, so you know the you know the old saying, um, you feed a man a fish, he eats for a day, you teach a man to fish, he eats for life. Um, when it when it comes to people not having enough food or or, or enough to drink or whatever, that's very dear to my heart. And it, it hurts me when I know that people are not able to to get food when they want to get food. And so I started doing this to not only teach men, women, children um, how to fish, um, also teach them how to fish out of kayaks, um, teach them how to filet fish. We go on different fishing trips um, several times a year. We just got back from Michigan. And so we are still a work in progress. Um, I'm still working. I got my letterhead coming in the mail. Um, I just got my logo, so I have to get that know, taking care of to uh, trademark that so it can be mine. So it's still a work in progress, but we are working towards um, being bigger and, and better. So, so every, anybody, kids, adults, and so we, uh, when, it, when it comes to the kids, it's really, right now it's really word of mouth or my Facebook page, I have a Fishman and Mission page as well that people can see. And it's kind of, I do a lot of videos, they're very positive videos, I have a lot of followers. Who just see the videos and make them laugh 
I actually catch fish and it gets people excited. So uh, people know about me. And so this particular young man I took this weekend, his mother was just at a meeting with me. She heard me talking about fishing. And he lives in my hometown area, which I, you know, I, I never met her, but she was excited because her son loves to fish a lot. And so I kind of took him under my wing and took him out on Saturday and taught him how to wade in the water. We had to actually have waders to wade in the water. And then um, to catch crappie, he's never caught crappie before. So he learned how to cast and not use um, live bait. We use a lot of artificial bait to catch the fish. And then we actually took him to Michigan on a fishing trip with, um, it was like um, 11 or 12 of us that went to Michigan on Saturday and to catch a lot of fish to do it and come back to, to be a blessing to people. And so anybody that has a desire to learn how to fish, whether it's on the bank, waders, or in the kayak, um, we can do that to help them. Um, myself, I was growing up in the neighborhood where we were you know, really um, wealthy, more wealthy at all. We were actually um, sort of poor. Um, just giving back to, uh, to the community. Um, there were several role models you know, in the neighborhood, you know, guys that I looked up to that sort of gave back. Um, and, and like Juan said, just the knowledge of teaching people um, how to do things, especially the younger guys, watching the lights sort of come on when, when they catch that first fish. Um, and then you know, giving them, seeing them get the confidence um, you know, learning to fish and, and also give back. You know, it's not only you know, teaching them something, but then teaching them that it's good to give back to the community as well. My role model was my mother. So coming from a small town in West Virginia, um, only being maybe one or two um, African-American families in the whole town, that are all in the street that we grew up on. Um, my mother was a hardworking single parent who worked two or three jobs to make sure that we were able to have the things that we needed. Um, not only did my mother do that for her own kids, my mother knew that all the other kids in the neighborhood uh, wasn't as fortunate as some other kids. So she, she put together a uh, big sale, uh, car washes, anything she could do to make money. And she would rent two buses to take all the kids in the apartment development to um, Kennywood Park, Kings Island, Sea World. And so I just kind of mimicked my mother. As a kid, I watched her. I said I always wanted to be like her. She was always good with people, good to people, and I wanted to be like my mother. For me, it, it wasn't a one role model. There were several individuals, um, more, more specifically my uncles. Um, all of my uncles, in a sense, I, I feel like I have a part of them in me. Um, they were constantly giving back to the community as well as the family. Brother uh, helping someone with a car repair, repairs in the home, um, and, and you know helping them with uh, additional money and so on. So I think it's all. Uh, uh, maybe the eight or nine uncles that I have that I sort of took a piece of all of them. Uh, maybe one of them today. The future. Um, you know, through God, all things are possible. This week's viral video. Damn straight for a reason and I got it. I seen a false prophet make a profit off knowledge. Just say you got it if you got it. Ironic. They step in the market and still shoplift. A bunch of pills popping with a mouth full of cotton. Join Believe 614 Nation and follow us for more videos, behind the scene footage, and your chance to win prizes at Believe614.com. Thank you for watching Believe 614 TV show and thank you to our sponsors.